So my name is Julie Lamb. I'm Head of Cancer and Palliative Care Services and Lead Cancer Nurse at Gateshead. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was just about managing fatigue um, related to cancer and also to, to do a little bit on, on kind of poor, on poor sleep. So I'm going to start really with the managing fatigue side of things. And I think it's just trying to think of actually sort, you know, what is fatigue? And I've put just some words there about, you know, it's sometimes it's that horrible kind of brain fog, brain fog, tiredness, zero energy, feeling absolutely wrecked, that type of thing. So that's what we're going to kind of look at and look at how we can um, maybe give you some tips to improve that. So next slide, please, Caroline. So sorry, just go back a one, please. So really just in there, so fatigue is when you feel tired, weak, drained and worn out. And it's just to really be clear that cancer related fatigue is different to normal tiredness um, because often if you're just um, normally tired, you would go to, you'd, you know, you'd have a lie down, you'd have a sleep and you would wake up feeling refreshed. But often with a cancer related fatigue, you, you just don't do that. You don't get that joy, unfortunately. And sometimes people just describe it as real kind of mental and physical exhaustion. So next slide there. So really, I think it's type of trying to look at why does it happen? So fatigue is really, it can be caused by the cancer itself. We know that people who've got, um, you know, lung cancers, often they present with just feeling really exhausted and tired and that not presenting that with a shortness of breath. So it's often the cancer that you have um, or the cancer treatments that, um, that you're having. And it's key to being remembering that that it's not just the chemotherapies, but the radiotherapy side of things can leave you with fatigue that is really ongoing long after your radiotherapy is finished. So you might think, right, I've done all of my radiotherapy and I'm going to pick up now. But actually, the radiotherapy is still working in your body for a period of weeks. And that fatigue that goes along with that will still continue. So it's being really mindful of that of when you I hear a lot of people saying all right okay my treatments are finished and I'm going to be fabulous but you have to remember that they're still having those ongoing side effects in your body and what are really key to thinking about in this is that really um, people can get really frustrated and think you know my like my body's letting me down but actually what you have to remember is that your body is putting up in an amazing fight against cancer and actually um, you know it, it can't do everything. It's really spinning all those plates. It's coping with the cancer itself. It's coping with the treatments that will give it. That So sometimes that fatigue, in a way, I'm not saying kind of just accept it and lie down and do, do nothing. But I think sometimes you have to accept that this is sometimes, you know, your body just trying to kind of recover itself. So the cancer itself and the cancer treatments can, can do that. Some of the medications that will give you, so um, some of the painkilling medications will have a side effect of really making you feel sleepy. So often the medications are, are the problem. We've got the side effects of treatment, particularly if you're having chemotherapy, where if that lowers your blood cells and that will give you um, what we, you know, anemia. And again, if you haven't got the red blood cells that are carrying your oxygen around your body, then everything will be that bit harder for you. So it might be that, you know, climbing up the stairs, if you think about it, if, you, if you're if you anemic, if you think about climbing up the stairs with three bags of shopping, that's the type of thing that your body is actually putting up with. So it, um, and people do say, well, you know, I, could, I can't even get up the stairs, but it's trying to remember that actually it's because your body is being weighted by everything else that it's having to deal with. The other thing is sometimes the changes in, in what you're eating, and that's very much the analogy of that, you know, if you don't put fuel in the car, um, the car's not going to go very far. So, and it's linking back to that first um, session that we had with the dietitian of, of thinking of when Emma was talking about, you know, making sure that we that you ate well, um, high energy foods and things like that. So trying to, you know, really keep on, on board of, of what you're eating and trying to think of what's the nourishing foods that will give your body some energy and some strength when it's really under pressure. So stress and mood change, including depression, it's really difficult to go through treatment with you know, feeling um, 
full of joy all of the time, you know, you will kind of get really low in mood. And I think if you think even before you had cancer, if sometimes if you if your mood was a bit dipped, that actually you, you get to that you can't feel like you can be bothered to do anything. The other thing, we've, and again, we've talked about this in earlier sessions about those horrible hot flushes that um, come over you um, and can come over you at any time, but often come over at night time and you're just getting yourself comfy in your bed. A hot flush kicks off and, you know, Bob's your uncle, you cannot sleep for another couple of hours. It's got on there fatigue. It's also caused by a lack of physical activity. And people will say, well, you know, you're telling me that my body's really struggling. And then you're telling us it's because I'm not doing enough exercise. I think it's bearing in mind and what I'm saying there is just that exercise level to keep some of your muscle strength. So um, to keep so that your, your leg muscles are strong enough to kind of keep up, keep your weight up and down the stairs. So it's not accepting that um, you just have to sit and do nothing. It's accepting that you still need to do some things to keep yourself fit. And fatigue can be also caused by other problems such as infection as well. So next slide, please, Caroline. So what I want to just put on is the causes of fatigue. You can just stick them all on, um, Caroline, if you like, because I think that's really is just what I was um, what I've just talked through. So it's kind of looking, it's thinking, um, Unfortunately, what we've got, if we we have even where we've got causes of fatigue, if we had the patient in the middle of that, because you might actually have that you that there's a load of those things that your body is dealing with. So side effect of treatment, hot flushes, um, the cancer itself. So it's not just sometimes that it's just one thing causing the fatigue. It can be lots of things at the same time that are all kind of, you know, coming together to just make this fatigue feel really overwhelming. Next slide, Caroline. So I'm going to just kind of go through a little bit of kind of some how to manage fatigue and how to do some coping strategies. So the first thing that I would ask you to do when you're managing fatigue is to figure out how it's affecting you, but also to rule out any other conditions. And what I would really suggest that you do is that you do a body checkout. And why I'm asking you to do that is to be really mindful that um, yes, you would cancer fa related fatigue is all awful, but what we have to really make sure is that the fatigue is related to that cancer related fatigue and it's not actually related to the fact that you've got an infection from your chemotherapy. Um, because obviously if, if it was fatigue related to that, we would want you to go straight um, to get checked. So I would say to you, you know, if you if you've got that kind of thing, I'm absolutely worn out, I feel absolutely wrecked. Just sit and stop for a minute and go, right, OK, let me just check things through. Um, so actually, how am I feeling um, in myself? Have I got a high temperature? Do I feel that um, I'm hot and flustered? Um, what's my appetite like? What's it like when I go for a wee? Is it burning or stinging? What's my breathing like? Am I coughing up phlegm? So all those things that often you'll find the chemotherapy nurse would ask you when you first go for your treatment. She'll ask you, she'll check your temperature. She'll ask you about um, how you're feeling. Um, she'll ask you about, you know, have you managed to be, you know, have you ate and drank? What are you, what are you um, drinking? Have you been sick? So what I would really ask you to do is to, when you start to think of that fatigue, just do a quick body check, think head to toe and think, right, okay. And then if there's nothing like that, so you're not coughing up phlegm, you haven't got a temperature, it's not burning when you have a wee, think, right, okay then. So I don't need to get any help for this, but what I have to recognise is that this is the, this is fatigue. And, um, and how can I deal with that? So next one, Caroline, please. What we say really is certainly what we wouldn't want you to do is to stop doing things. But what we'd ask you to do is to pace yourself. So break down activities into smaller tasks. So if you're thinking about, um, you know, you're going to um, you want to do washing, you might want to sort out all of the washing. So you've got your washing piles, but then actually you might need to find if, if your washing baskets like mine um, that you need five minutes rest because it's took you you know 15 minutes to sort out um, all of your colors um, so try and think you know smaller tasks um, and don't kind of rush off trying to think right okay then in the day I've got I would normally I'll do all my washing I'll get it all dried and I'll have it ironed by the end of the day 
it's that's I think I would say that's unrealistic in normal life and it's certainly unrealistic when you're facing um, uh, cancer and cancer treatments. Um, so Caroline do you want to put the next one on? You can put them all on if you like Caroline and then I can just there uh, lovely thanks. So like I say pace yourself, break down activities into smaller tasks. If you find that you know carrying um, hanging the washing out um, is really debilitating and wearing you out what I would say is um, stick it in the tumbler and make it a bit, you know, think about making things a little bit easier. Or if you do really want to hang your washing out on the line, can somebody else do it for you? Um, or can you actually lower your washing line a little bit so that actually you're not reaching up um, to, ha to peg the washing out? Because sometimes reaching up and trying to hold your arms up um, and get you know get that all that washing out and get get it all pegged up it can be really tiring so that's another tip is just to kind of lower your washing line a little bit so it's a little bit lower so it's easier to, to hang things up um other things i would say is you know seek help if somebody off somebody you know if one of your friends comes over and, and offers to wash the dishes or hoover the floor take great advantage of that and take advantage of your friends to to help you Plan ahead is what I've put there as well. So if you know you're going to have a busy day, try to have a restful day the day before. So don't think that you, you know, oh, I'm having my grandchildren on Tuesday and then I've arranged to go to the Metro Centre on the on the Wednesday because you know that that day will be exhausting on the Tuesday. So you need to try and be able to kind of recoup. So try and plan so that if you're going to have it this a busy event just try and give yourself a bit of a rest beforehand and give yourself a bit of a rest afterwards the other thing what i've said there is to complete a fatigue diary and i know that might sound a bit diff bit daft but um what's really helpful sometimes is that sometimes by just doing that for a couple of days you can start to see that when you when your body's got its most energy so you might find that actually um, when you've managed to you get up on a morning and actually you've got quite a bit of energy. So you could do a couple of things on the morning, but by the time it gets to the afternoon, you feel really worn out. So try and plan when you've got the um, most energy. But and if you do that, even for, a, you know, for a couple of days or a week, you can start to see when when your pattern is of when you're um, fatigued. And also it can give you, if you do it for a longer term, you can often see that um, when you've had a chemotherapy, that actually you might find for the first couple of days that you're not too bad. And then from maybe about, you know, day four or five, that horrible tiredness starts to kick in. So you'll know that maybe, you know, for the first three days after your chemo, you might be quite good. But then so plan the activities then because you know that day four or five when the chemo's really got into your system, um, those might be the days when you really do need to kind of look after yourself and just be more restful. So I would say complete a fatigue diary and um, Matt Millen do do a booklet um, which is called Managing Fatigue and actually in there they do have a fatigue diary that you can um, that you can fill in but really you just need a piece of paper and just put the times of the day um, and and just fill in how how you're feeling and what your energy is like. The last one on there of regulating your sleep wake cycle. That's really difficult because sometimes people think, you know, if I'm fatigued, the best thing I need to do is just kind of lie down and go to sleep. What I would say is that you might find that your fatigue is so overwhelming that you have to think, right, OK, I'm going to have to have a nana nap. You know, I'm going to have to have, you know, 20 minutes um, sleep. But what I would try and suggest is that you do keep it fairly short have 20 minutes and get somebody to, to wake you up or set the alarm on your phone so that you can wake yourself up because if not you can find that actually you, we know we already said on that first slide sometimes you don't you wake up and you don't feel refreshed but then actually all you've done is really kind of damaged your sleep cycle for the, for going to bed that night so if you really do need to have a have a little nap just make sure it's quite short next slide caroline please so we've got there that really, and it always seems a bit strange that people say, well, I'm really tired, but you're telling us to do exercise. And I think this takes us back to kind of all of the work that Caroline does of that. There is really good evidence that physical activity can help with fatigue. 
Um, and again, what I'm not saying is, um, you know, go, you know, go and run two miles. What I'm talking about is some exercise where you could, you know, go out um, and, and, you know, walk maybe round the block. But think when you're walking around the block, think a little bit of can I increase my pace a little bit? Can I move my arms a little bit more? So I'm getting a little bit more um, aerobic exercise. So that's the type of thing that I'm um, what, that I'm meaning when I'm saying, you know, a little bit of physical activity. And if you can feel like you can do a bit more, um, then that's great. But um, certainly a little bit of exercise can be really helpful. And that what that will ha help with is it will boost your energy and boost your appetite. So it'll boost your appetite. So you're fueling the car again with nutritious food and it can just give you a little bit more energy and can improve your sleep. So though it, it's definitely um, a link between fatigue and doing a little bit of exercise. So if you can try and um, do that, that would be great. And remember that, you know, some exercise is better than no exercise at all. So that's really what I would say in relation to fatigue. Um, now, what I had been going to say was when I'll stop there and ask for questions, but I'm conscious that because we're recording this, um, do you want me to just continue on, Caroline, and take questions at the end? Yeah, do you just want to continue? Yeah. Lovely. OK, so what we can do is um, at the end, we can talk about some of your questions on fatigue if you have any. But I'm going to just do a little bit on sleep as well. So next slide, Caroline, please. So this is really just thinking about, you know, sleep. What is it and why is it so important? So sleep is that rest and state in which our body's just not active and our mind is just is unconscious. And actually, it's a really essential function and it allows your body and your mind to recharge. And what we would hope is that it leaves you refreshed and alert. Um, what we definitely know um, with um, with patients who have cancer is that sometimes, like we've said, it doesn't leave you feeling refreshed and alert because you've probably had three night sweats um, during that time and you've been up three times changing IT and your sheet's been wet and uncomfortable. So it's not leaving you feeling refreshed and alert and it's probably making leaving you feeling really bad tempered and grumpy by the time you've put that night in and you feel like you've done a night shift rather than being um, refreshed. But it's really important sleep. Um, it helps the brain consolidate your learning and memory. And there's a lot of research that shows that actually um, not getting enough sleep can actually cause physical illnesses. Um, and there's lots of research into, into that type of um, area of that actually um, sleep can actually you know, cause us to get really poor health. There's research to show that people who work constant night shift have worse health um, than, than those of us who don't. So it's really important. It helps us to regulate our um, body clock and it keeps us in a kind of a circadian ry rhythm so that as humans, we kind of operate on that 24 hour cycle. So it's really important that we get good quality sleep and the good quality sleep will help us with fatigue and reduce your need to sleep during the day if we can um, you know, if we can get decent sleep. Next slide, please, Caroline. So, OK, so what we talk a little bit about and you can Google this type of thing, as you'll see, it's called sleep hygiene. Um, and these are just really kind of simple measures, really, um, about um, how to get a good night's sleep. Um, and some of them seem really obvious, but actually, you know, sleep at regular times. So most adults need between six to nine hours of sleep every night. So it's trying to get that bedtime routine, which is, you know, for those of us who've had children, you know, and you're trying to get that bedtime routine for you for your kids because you know if you get them into that bedtime routine you won't have the nighttime horrors when they're far too tired and um and they're, and they're having tantrums and you'll know that your baby will go to bed at seven o'clock and then you'll have a lovely refreshed baby who wakes up at seven o'clock the next morning um well we are the same of that um we need to have regular sleep and it's often just our work and lives and our kind of um family commitments that keep us from being able to do that. 
So that sleep at regular times. The other thing is important to try and wake up at the same time every day. So if you've been going to um, work and you're used to waking up at, at seven o'clock every morning to get up for work, try and keep to that same um, same type of rhythm. And I don't know if any of you years have ever felt that a day when you do try to have a lie in and you actually just wake up and you, you've got an absolutely starting headache from that. So it's to try and make sure that you can keep to regular times and get up at the same time on a morning. Make your bedroom sleep friendly, which sounds really kind of strange and that. But what I really mean of that is that your bedroom ideally needs to be dark. It needs to be quiet. And I've put in there tidy so and be kept at a temperature of between 18 and 24 degrees. So it's better for your, for your room to be kind of on the cooler side. Um, I've put in there um, tidy and um, I'll, why the reason why I added that is that um, from my own kind of experience in, the, in that we're in the midst of getting building work and our bedroom is just full of a load of stuff from the dining room and from other rooms in the house so it's really chaotic and I found that when I've gone to bed on the night time it feels really uncomfortable and it doesn't feel that kind of restful of that you know you get into bed and your, your sheets are fresh and you think oh that's lovely and certainly my bedroom at the minute's not like that and I know that, that my sleep isn't as good as it should be because I'm just not in that kind of right zone when I'm going into bed. Avoid caffeine after 12 midday. Um, again, that can be quite difficult for people and a lot of people will say to me, well, um, oh, caffeine doesn't affect me um, and I can drink caffeine, you know, until up till 10 o'clock at night. But actually what I would say is try just to have a few days of actually avoiding caffeine after 12 midday. Drink decaf if you need to, of decaf tea or coffee and just actually see, because sometimes we very much think that caffeine isn't affecting our sleep. But then when we start to cut it out, you can start to see that actually um, the caffeine has um, impacted on your sleep. And the other thing that I've got in there is about avoiding the nighttime tipple. So you'll hear lots of people say, or you know, have a little have a little drink before you um before you go off to sleep. Um, you know, that'll really help. But actually it doesn't. So actually what really what actually happens then is that it um the alcohol will help you to go off to sleep, but then what happens is that it um it actually causes you to kind of have a worse night's sleep and it will cause you to um to wake up. So I would really encourage you to avoid having a nighttime tipple. And what I've put in there is to have to try warm milk instead. So there is actually um, research that shows that um, milk does have sleep inducing properties. And the reason why it has sleep inducing properties is that there's an amino acid called tryptophan um, in milk, and that helps. Um, to produce serotonin and melatonin. We're not kind of getting too technical, it's, but those um, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that um, impacts on your mood and reasoning. But melatonin is a hormone that's released in your body in response to darkness and it helps you sleep. Um, and actually, if there's not a lot of kind of, um, you know, medications for sleep but actually we do have when people have poor sleep we do actually prescribe melatonin so that's why it's kind of really important rather than taking a drug actually um, try some some warm milk and that can help to release that um, that melatonin and help you sleep and there's there's also other foods that are high in tryptophan so it doesn't have to necessarily just be warm milk but we know that um Cheese, chicken, turkey, fish, sunflower seeds, peanuts, pumpkin seeds and soybeans, they all have um, tryptophan in. So even trying to um, add a little bit of that to you, um, a little bit of those foods to your diet can help as well. But if I and I'm certainly not a killjoy and, in, in, you know, an alcoholic, you know, having alcohol, but I would certainly say if you've got poor sleep, having a nighttime tipple is the thing that you really need to avoid. Next slide, Caroline, please. 
The other thing is really winding down. It's really critical to prepare for bed. And again, if you think of that, what we would do with our own with our children when they were little, we often would have um, started to wind down with them by, you know, putting them in the bath, getting the jammies on. They'd have a little bit of supper. They'd probably have a cuddle and a and a and a little read of a book. And all of that is us winding our children down, and we need to actually also do that ourselves. So um, a warm bath can really help, not a boiling hot one so that you end up being, um, you know, kicking off hot flushes, but just a nice warm bath that can help you get your body to a temperature that starts to make it um, um, rest. So that can be really helpful. The other thing is that a lot of people say, I'm really shattered, I, get, I climb into bed, um, and I think, right, I'm worn out, and suddenly my brain kicks off and starts to think, oh, God, what about this? What about that? I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I wish I'd asked the nurse about that. I'm worried about so-and-so. So what I would suggest is that you have a just a bit of paper by the side of the bed and write down those thoughts. So if there's stuff that you think, I really need to remember that to, for tomorrow, and bear in mind that we've already talked about kind of fatigue and foggy brains and things, write it down so that then you can just write it down, get it out of your mind onto some paper and just and leave it there to pick it up in the morning. And I think often it's the same to do that with, with worries. If there's something really worrying you, because often I think that um, it's that age old thing of that you can be coping with cancer, but then sometimes you get into bed at night time, it's getting dark, you might be on your own, your mind starts to whir with those what if questions, what if this happens, what if that happens? And sometimes just writing them down um, gets them out of your mind. And then the next morning when you look at them, you just feel a little bit more able to kind of think, all right, I was really worried about that last night, but actually I'm not now. So it's kind of put it to bed and you can um, get on with a decent sleep and get on with your day. The other thing that's that they talk about that can really help is just some, you know, some gentle relaxation exercises. And I put in there just kind of light yoga stretches. So um, but I think that's really just having a little look on, on the Internet um, about, you know, what gentle stretches that could we do. And I'm sure Caroline's got some examples of that as well. So just things that start to kind of help us stretch our body, think about some breathing and kind of calm calm down and there's loads of relaxation apps and the, the calm app and things that you can actually use to have you know um kind of some narrated script to help you wind down and, and go off to sleep next slide caroline please again what the um, sleep hygiene says is you know reading a book or listening to the radio can help to relax your mind by distracting it but avoid the use of smartphones, tablets or other electronic devices because it's that kind of blue light that comes from your devices that actually um, can stimulate your brain and it can really have a negative effect on your sleep. So really try to avoid, um, you know, lying in bed, just scrolling through Facebook or um, scrolling through Instagram because it might feel quite relaxing, but the colours of the on the screens actually do stimulate your brain and can stop you going to sleep. And on there as well, I've got which seems a little bit daft, but what it says is if you're lying in bed and you're tossing and turning and you can't go to sleep, the best advice is actually just to get up because what you find yourself doing is tossing and turning and getting more and more stressed. And the research evidence shows that actually if you just get up, if after 20 minutes you're not asleep, get up, go downstairs, try and make yourself some warm milk or, you know, a decaf um, warm drink and just kind of sit and sip that. And then when you feel more sleepy, go back to bed. Because what, what happens is if you continue to just toss and turn, you get really like negative connotations of your bedroom and then you'll just start to before you've even got into bed, you'll be worrying, thinking, God, I hope I'm going to sleep tonight. Hope I'm going to sleep. So if you can't sleep after 20 minutes, unless it's going to wake up the whole household, try and just get up and go downstairs. Next slide, please, Caroline. There's also a lot about kind of complementary therapies. So, you know, I've put in there um, relaxation, meditation, massage therapy, yoga, anything like that that might help. Um, 
certainly, you know, if some aromatherapy in the room, um, in your bedroom might just help you to relax, um, you know, with a with a diffuser rather than I would never advocate that we use that you use a candle in your bedroom because what we're trying to invoke is sleep and then I wouldn't want you to leave a candle on but you know there's a lot of kind of diffuser devices that were that can plug in that will just um, diffuse nice you know relaxing smells to help you kind of engage and go off to sleep so there are certainly things that are helpful to look at next slide Caroline please I think that's the, that, end. That the end of it. All right. OK, so there were, that's just a few ideas. And then can you stop sharing the screen, Caroline, so I can stop the recording? Thank you.